I want to continue the journey that we are on talking about relational intelligence and how do we develop healthy biblical kingdom relationships. And next week I want to talk to you about loyalty. I want to talk to you about loyalty and covenant, but but this week as I mentioned to you last week, I want to talk to you about something a little bit different. I want to talk to you about likability and favor. Everybody say likability. Everybody say favor. And the truth is that you and I need both in order to be successful. And when I say successful, I, I say it in the biblical sense as to what God said to Joshua, that God said, I will make your way successful. And so, you know, my friends, you always hear me say that we are commanded to love people, but not necessarily commanded to like people. But how many understand that if you are liked, you are going to get further ahead in life? You know, I had a statement that I wrote here in my notes and I said this, I said, you know, relational intelligence is all fun and games until somebody loses a friend. And the reality is we, we romanticize about relationships and we even talk about biblical relationships and scripture, but until the, until the rubber meets the road, and I'll get into this in, in loyalty, because the reality is you really don't know what kind of a relationship you have with an individual until that relationship is tested. When those relationships get put to the test, then you will know truly, you know truly what those relationships are about, and truly you'll know even what is pe- what, in, what is in people's hearts. But I want to give credit where credit is due. Before I get to the reading of the passage, this this actual term likability. I, I began to read an article. I found an article that was on Facebook actually from a an author, a coach. His name is Michael Hyatt. I don't know if you have uh, ever heard about him, but he, he wrote this article, very very short article about the likability quotient, the likability quotient, and why in particular for leaders that likability was important. And I, it really it really piqued my curiosity. I thought, what is this guy talking about? What he what is he what is he saying? And I I began to study it. I began to delve into it. Uh, God allowed me to experience some things that I that I recognized that you know there are spiritual people, good people, well-meaning people that are not always liked. Yeah. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You know, in the in the corporate world, we 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 talk about chemistry. In other words. Do, do people fit in? As a matter of fact, before we hire anybody here at the church, we actually have them, have them do a personality test because we want to recognize, will people, chemistry, will they fit in to the organization, to the values, so on and so forth. So I began to study, and the more I studied it, I actually put it into my curriculum at school. I, I, I began to build on it. I began to get more insight uh, from God on this area of likability. But, I, but one thing I do know, and I've done a lot of study on, is the idea of favor, God's favor. And so when, when we're talking about likability and favor, I want you to imagine a train track. I want you to imagine the, the train tracks that run parallel to each other, one of them being likability and the other one is favor. And here's what I mean about the train track, because when we talk about favor, favor is God, and I'm going to give you the definition in a moment, God pouring his favor upon you. It is, it is something that is dynamic, it is an anointing, it is a charisma that comes from the Spirit, you obtain it from God. But when it comes to likability, you and I need to put some some work into it. We need to develop this this concept so that people will actually like us. This is listen. Anybody that is going to want to be in relationship with you or you with them, what what you want to like those people? Does that make sense? People don't want to be in relationship with people they that they don't like. But but sometimes we mix these two up. And I want you to know that there is a difference between likability and favor. I want you to know that God will do his part, but you need to do your part. Are we good so far? And so I want to show you, I want to show you an image. So uh, Michael Hyatt, that actually is not my image. It's his image of this of this bridge that I want to I want to talk to you about and I want to show you and then we're going to get into uh, we're going to get into the passage here in in just a moment but let me read the quote let me read the quote to you I'm going to quote from him uh, Michael Hyatt said this ever wonder why some people are likable and others are not let me ask you this question how likable are you today 
from one to 10, from one to 10, how likable are you with others? And if you're sitting there today or you're watching online and, and you have an attitude that says, well, you know what, pastor, I don't care what people think about me. That's your problem. That's your problem. Because as much as it doesn't matter what people think about us, how many understand that it matters? And so he says this, ever wonder why some people are likable and others aren't? He says, without a high likability quotient, it's tough to succeed in almost any area of life. By the way, that would include the church. He says, especially as a leader or an entrepreneur, if you want to win with people, they not only have to know you, they also have to trust you. If you want to win with people, they not only have to know you, they also have to trust you. Now watch what he says. Likeability is the bridge between the two. It is a prerequisite to trust. Why? Because I'm not going to trust someone unless I like them. Let me say it again. It is a prerequisite to trust. Why? Because I'm not going to trust someone I don't like. Isn't it interesting that not only do we love God, we like God. And if you don't trust God, that means you don't like him. And if you don't like God and you don't trust God, it probably means that you don't know him. This is why we have, we have so many people that want to antagonize them, speak evil of, of God and of the Lord. Why? Because they don't, they don't know him, which means they don't trust him and means they don't like him. But here's the truth. The reason that God is not liked is not because of God, it's because of us. It is because of our misrepresentation of who God is. And then people go, well, that's what God must be like because that's what the church is like and that's what his people are like. And, and they're just angry and nasty. And the reality is that we give God a bad name. And so if God will put out his favor upon us, if we will become more likable and actually represent God better and more accurately, how many understand that Jesus was likable? Not everybody liked him. But he was likable. It was really, it was the religious system that didn't like him. He had friends with the Romans. He had friends with sinners and prostitutes and, and whatever. It was really the religious system that, that couldn't stand him because he kind of he cross-cut them every time. And so they didn't like him. But the reality is that as an individual, he was a likable person. Now, here's what I want you to hear today because I'm going to give you some practical things on, on being likable. I'm going to talk to you about the favor of God. But what I am not saying today what I am not teaching you is how to manipulate people. I'm not saying this is, how you, this is how you go out there and you get what you want because you're going to learn how to become likable and then you can kind of twist people and you know those of you that are in sales and I'm going to talk about sales people in a minute and, and it, yeah, get ready sales people, get ready. Um, that, that's not what I'm talking about today. But how many understand that, that if you are likable you'll actually gain sales? Here's the truth. People deal with people. People deal with people. It, you know, I, I just sold my, I just, you know, sold my, I had to sell my mother's house. And, and, and the reality is I, I dealt with a certain real estate agent. And, and my friends, listen, it, it did, I, I don't even, honestly, I don't even know if she's Remax or uh, Royal. I, honestly, I don't even know who she works with. And I really don't care because people deal with people. This is why it's important. If you're an owner, if you're a business person, please understand that even the people that you hire and the people that represent you, it's incredibly important because those people matter to people. It's not just the, it's not just the label. People can make or break you. And this is why when we talk about relational intelligence, we talk about emotional intelligence, we talk about likability, that the more you are like, the further on in life you're going to get. And when people don't like you, guess what? They're going to reject you. They're going to repel you. They, they don't want to be in your company. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. But I want to get to the Word of God in two places. If we could stand this morning, I want you to, first of all, I want you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Chronicles 4.10. And then I want you to turn to Luke chapter 2 in the New Testament. Uh, my, my iPad, for some reason, says to me it's going to die. It's at... It's at 16%, and you're like, all right, pastor, we're going to get out of here earlier. Um, but I'm telling you, if this iPad dies, I'm going to preach longer, all right? So you better pray for battery life. All right. First Chronicle 4.10 is a prayer, a prayer of Jabez. I want to say this to you, church. This is not a good luck prayer. 
You don't pray this so that we don't even believe in luck. We believe in the favor and the blessing and the grace of God. Amen. Amen. These things that I see on Facebook, you know, oh, if you, if you send this prayer to 10 people, God's going to bless you. If you, if you read this in the next three minutes, God's going to do a miracle for you. Listen, God doesn't respond to that nonsense. That's all this hocus pocus, like, just tell those people, give your head a shake. All right. And so Jabez, the Bible says, was a more noble individual than all his brothers. And there was something in his heart that he began to pray. And the Bible says this, it says, and Jacob, Jabez called on the name, Jabez called on the God of Israel saying, oh, that you would bless me indeed. In other words, that you would grant me favor and enlarge my territory, not my body, my territory, right? Influence, leadership, authority. That your hand, the hand of authority, the hand of fellowship, that your hand would be with me and that you would keep me from evil that I may not cause pain. And so God granted him what he requested. We're going to pray this over ourselves right now because it's a Bible prayer. And by the way, church, the best prayers that you can pray are the ones that are in the Bible. So can we pray this? I want you to, I want you to follow me. Just say, oh, oh. come on, like you mean it. Oh. oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me and that you would keep me from evil that I may not cause pain and say this, Lord, grant my request. Now I want you to turn to Luke. I want you to turn to Luke chapter two, because I want you to see that even our Lord Jesus required favor from God in order to accomplish his assignment on the earth. You remember the story? I'm going to give you the background. They were on a family trip. And in those days, you know, families would, would gather and, you know, it didn't probably, you probably didn't know where your children were because there was a lot of relatives in the caravan and, and somehow they lost Jesus. They'd be, you imagine telling God we lost the savior, right? And so they're heading back home and he's not there. They, you know, they're like, oh my God, three days. They're like, where is he? They go back and, and then they find him. And, uh, in, in, in 48, <laughs> in 48, Mary says, son. His mother said to him, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been frantic, searching for you everywhere. But, but why did you need to search? He asked. Did you not know that I must be about my father's house or my father's business? In other words, Jesus is already getting a, a revelation of who he is and what he needs to do, but they did not understand what he meant. Now watch this. Then he returned to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. Catch that church. He was obedient. Everybody say obedient. The Bible says that his mother stored all these things in her heart. Now watch this. Now Jesus grew. Everybody say he grew. Notice the son of God wasn't automatically born with what, what he, Luke is about to tell us. He had to grow. He had to develop into these things. He had to learn obedience. He, he had to learn to be subject unto them. And Jesus grew in wisdom, in stature, and in favor, watch this, with God and all the people. With God and all the people. Church, I just want to tell you something. Be very leery of people that say to you, all I need is God. Just me and God. They're unbiblical. They are dangerous people. They probably lack emotional intelligence and they probably lack the ability to have very good relationships. And so they think because, you know, I can just get with God, God, you know, God wants me, God loves me, God likes me. It's unbiblical. I want you to see that God, that Jesus needed favor with God and with people. Amen. I want you to turn to somebody and tell them, that they are to be liked and they are to be favored. Can you do that? Turn to somebody, say, you're to be liked and you're to be favored. <laughs> I want to read, I want to read a couple of things so that you will understand. It's going to be on your, on the PowerPoint here of what, what is favor. First of all, let me, let me give you the Webster definition. It's a kind act. It's a, 
of friendly regard, it's goodwill, it's preferential treatment, it's partiality, it's a gift bestowed. My, my friends, you understand that when God favors you, he is, he is treating you uniquely, he is treating you uh, special, he, he prefers you. He is doing you a favor. How many times, how many times do we say to people, hey, do me a favor? In other words, go out of your way to do something for me. And we are, we are hopefully grateful when people do us favors, but I want you to understand that your father already favors you. If you're in Christ, if he is your father, if you're part of the kingdom of God, the favor of God is upon you. And it's not, you know, you're no longer under a curse. You're not cursed. You are favored. Now, just because you are favored doesn't mean everybody likes you. Come on now. Joseph of the Old Testament, his father favored him and gave him a special coat, but it was that very coat that got him into trouble and got attention from the rest of his family. And so his father favored him and his brothers detested him. Sometimes the favor of God is actually going to attract the ire of the enemy or the ire of others. So when I talk about favor, it doesn't mean that everything's always going to go your way, that you're never going to have any kind of trouble. But what it does mean is that God opens doors for you. God gives you breakthroughs. God allows you to move from level to level because you're on assignment, because he loves you. Come on now. Somebody give praise to God. Amen. Listen to, listen to what Lance Wall now says about favor. He says, it is the irresistible charisma of Christ that wraps itself around a person who has yielded themselves to the fulfillment of a heavenly objective. In other words, when I give my life to God, this, whether you call it an anointing, uh, whether, whether you call it a charisma, whatever your definition is, it's like the Lord wraps you in favor and all of a sudden people want to do things for you. People want to open doors for you. People want to be kind to you. People want to bless you. People want to uh, touch you in, in, in various ways. Why? Not so much because they like you, but because the favor of God is on you and they don't even recognize why it's on you. Even as a professor, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to admit this, but every, every semester there, and these are all God's people, but, but there are just some people that, that stand out. They stand out, and, 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 and because of the favor that is on their, on their life, you, you begin to give them preferential treatment. And so, you know, the idea is that we want to live in this kind of like communistic society, which is, which is a lie, and, and we want to have the idea that everybody gets treated exactly the same, and the fact of the matter is, it is true. We all want to be favored, but you know what the truth is? Let's take pastor. For example, people have short memories. We, we forget what pastor did for us last month and we watch, Oh, how come he did so-and-so a favor? And then rather than rejoicing, we get upset. We get jealous. We get angry. We gossip. We spear. Not in our church, other churches, other churches. Listen to the rest of this quote. It says, favor is the attraction of God to you that releases an influence through you that creates a supernatural inclination in others to like you, to trust you, to cooperate with you, and to do things for you that they would not normally do. Have you ever experienced, even out in the, even out in the world, that, that all of a sudden somebody says, I don't know why I'm going to do this for you, but I'm going to do this. God's favor. God's blessing. People give you deals. People open, as I mentioned, they, they open doors. They, they make things happen. Why? Because you are, you are on assignment. And so in the Bible, we just read about Jesus and Joseph. We know that Daniel experienced the favor of God. Esther obtained the grace of God. Nehemiah, Abraham, Gideon, and Mary, who, who you know, even the angel said to her, you are blessed and highly favored, Mary. You've been chosen. God has, God has picked you out from all the people. And my friends, here's the truth. All of you, those of you that maybe suffer from uh, rejection issues and various stigmas, I want you to understand that the God of all the universe picked you out from everybody else and said, you're my son, you're my daughter. I favor you. Now, this is not so we become proud and cocky and 
and all the rest of it. You're going to hear me talk about this in just a moment, but I want you to understand that this supernatural anointing is, is operating in your life. This, this favor of God, this charisma that the Lord is more than happy. And, and when we talk about things like blessing, we talk about grace, we, we talk about breakthroughs and breaking chains. All these things come down to the favor of God. I want to say it again. My friends, listen, Daniel was highly favored, but he wound up in a den of lions. The three Hebrew boys were highly favored, but they wound up in the fiery furnace. It's, please don't get the idea that if I'm favored, everything is going to go my way. No, the reality is that if you are favored, it means that God's hand is with you. And no matter what the enemy or wicked people are doing, the favor of God will always over supersede that. It was the favor of God that worked in Joseph's life that, that all from the, from the moment he had that dream and from the moment that even his own family sold him out, that everywhere he went, Joseph rose. Amen. Joseph rose and everything he touched, whether it was Potiphar's house, whether it was the prison, I don't know how you prosper a prison, he prospered the prison, he prospered Egypt. Everywhere he went, it prospered. Why? Because the favor of God was on him. But don't miss this. It doesn't mean that Joseph did nothing. It doesn't mean that Joseph was lazy. It doesn't mean that Daniel was lazy or that Jesus was lazy. It doesn't mean that, oh, because I am, because I am favored, God is going to do everything for me. No, no, no. There are things that God expects you to do. As a matter of fact, God is not going to manage your relationships. You have to do that. You have to do that with the anointing of the Lord because the Lord will do his part. So if we have this, this track of favor. Everybody say favor. favor. Where does it come from? It's in you. Tell somebody, prophesy to them, say you're favored. favored. Tell them you're favored. favored. Now say this to yourself, say I am favored. favored. And that's not a conceited thing. It's, that's the facts. That is the reality. You, you ought to get up every morning, look in that mirror and say, you are blessed and highly favored. Amen. Huh? Amen. Come on now. You ought to say to yourself, you are good looking, you are handsome, you are beautiful. Yeah. Self-talk. Because the reality is that your subconscious is working against you. Remember, remember I told you self-talk? Seven out of it, ten thoughts are all negative. Six of those seven are in the subconscious mind. You have enough evil. You have enough negativity working against you. And, and you know, at, at my own risk, you know, Pastor Mark, at my own risk today, I, I, I'm preaching this message and I'm thinking, people now are going to accuse me of being Joel Olstein. You know, that I'm, that I'm going to give you this. You know what? I, 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 let, let me tell you something about Joel Olstein. First of all, I know people that know him personally. And the individual that you always see on that screen and, and, and the criticisms that, that that man gets, that is not the true person. Just, just, so, just so you understand that, that we just don't judge people because we see them, we see them on a screen. But, but there, is, there is this idea that, listen, I don't want you leaving here like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm all that and a bag of chips and, you know, Pastor Chubb, favored and now I'm all proud. Listen, listen, God knows how to take a little pin to your balloon. Psst. And you'll be going like, Psst. Notice I, I, I was doing it up here, right? Psst. I'm not referring to something else. All right, now, now watch this. I want to be, be practical. <laughs> Some of you are going to get that at 3 o'clock. I want to be practical. <laughs> if you are attractive, if you are an attractive individual, you have attractive features and whatever, you know, they say, well, you know, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. True. But, but in general, we know when people are more attractive than others. Yes. If you are attractive, you have a head start. Proven fact. Attractive people are liked immediately. People want to do favors for them. People, listen, if, if you get stopped by the police and you're an attractive person. Now, those of you that are going, my God, I'm so attractive. I'm so beautiful. I'm, you know, um, watch this. You're only beautiful until people really get to know you. Somebody actually wrote a song. She's not beautiful. She just looks that way, right? 
So how many understand that there is a beauty that also comes from the inside? And I truly believe with all my heart that the anointing and the favor of God actually makes people more attractive than they really are. They say, Pastor, you're, you're being so fleshly today. No, no, no. The, the Bible actually tells us that Joseph was an attractive person. If, if Joseph wasn't a handsome man, uh, Mrs. Potiphar wouldn't have made googly eyes at him. If the boy had been ugly, if the boy had been ugly, he'd have been better off because she'd have just went, you ugly. Uh, you know, he was attractive. I really believe, now the Bible doesn't tell us this, but I think she was attractive. You know why? Because if she's ugly, then the, tr the temptation is less. She must have been attractive. He's attractive. The Bible tells us that David was attractive. Now watch this. The Bible tells us that Jesus was not attractive. He was common. Forget the Hollywood movies. In other words, he wasn't going to give himself this advantage. But then there was something on the inside of Jesus that caused him to be attractive, that attracted people to him. But, but my friends, listen, if you are attractive, you have an advantage. That's a reality. If you have charisma, if you have personality that is dynamic, that draws people, you have an advantage. People are drawn to those kind of people. Let me give you an example. I teach you some of my leadership course. If I take you to a, a children's nursery, I will show you who the leaders are amongst those little kids. You will watch children follow other children. Amongst that, where did those children go to leadership school? Where, where did they learn this? It's, it's in them. They have the raw materials. God has given it to them. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they develop it or even become leaders, but let's be honest. Some children are born. People are born with personality. They're, they're born with charisma. They're, 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 they're attractive little children. They don't need to learn this. So people say to me, well, pastor, are leaders born or are they made? Both. You may not be born with all the raw materials, but how many understand that you can develop them? As a matter of fact, most of the people that God calls in the Bible probably didn't have the raw materials. This is why they resisted God. So if you have great personality, if you're an attractive person, and I'm not here to qualify what is attractive, what isn't attractive, what, what, but I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, companies spend billions of dollars advertising attractive people. Have you noticed something in marketing lately? Have you noticed the switch in what used to be attractive that now they want more real people? Huh? We want to advertise real people. Have you ever, have you ever gone to a magazine and, and you're like, oh, those clothes look great, and then you go to the store and they don't look great on you? I remember going to the gym. I was, I was a, this is when I was like 220 pounds. I remember going to the gym. I got really upset because, you know, in those days you could, and I, I still today, you know, they, they could, you know, if you wanted, they would give you a towel, you know, to work out and shower and stuff like that. And, and I got really upset because I was like, wow, how come I get all the small towels and people get these bigger towels that, Oh, you know, they can wrap it around themselves twice. I'm like, what, what is going on here? Until I found out the towels were all the same size. It took me a moment to pick that one up. I'm like... <laughs> There's a reason this towel is tight, bro. And it's why we're here. And speaking of the gym, I want to say this. I, I heard this. I've been watching these, you know, YouTube videos. And God bless people that have, exper that have expertise, you know. And um, this, this one individual, he said, to, he said on this video, he said, you know, he said, the first day you go to the gym and then you go look in the mirror, nothing is going to be different. And the next day and the next week and maybe even a month. And, but then he said this. He said, there will come a time. There will come a time when all of a sudden you will look 
or you will feel something that all of a sudden paid off. And you know what we call that? Consistency. Consistency. Yeah. And this morning, I, I was saying to Pastor Mo, because you know, I've been, I've been working hard since Dr. Charles was here. I've, lo- I've put on muscle mass and I've, I've lost 12 pounds. I went into the closet. I'm wearing pants today that I haven't been able to wear in a long time. And I'm like, woo! <laughs> Come on now. That, that creates call. What, Pastor, why are you saying that? Because relational intelligence is like that. You're like, I'm doing this and I fail. I'm doing this and it's not working. I'm, I'm doing this and my relationships aren't developing. I'm doing and I'm doing. And then all of a sudden there'll be a day. Because you're consistent. Because you made a decision somewhere to be, to be biblical, to be kingdom, to allow the favor of God to operate in your life. And that you're going to do some work to be likable. Nicole here, my friend, the body, I've got, I've got a weightlifting champion on this side. I've got um, a fitness champion over here. I've got another lady that lost a hundred and what? 117. You lost like a human. Hey? And watch this. See how they sit in the front? They sit in the front to intimidate me. I'm not intimidated, ladies. So I said to Nicole... I digress. I said, listen, I need, I need to work on my, on my glutes and on my hip flexors. I need mobility and stretching. And she sends me, she sends, God bless her. She sends me this video. You know, this guy, he's like, he's twisted like a pretzel. And, and you know, and so I said to her, Nicole, I said, bless your heart for sending me the video. I said, I can't even start on the first exercise. I can't get past the fact that he's cross-legged. I said, she goes, pastor. One step at a time. Amen. How many know that if you stretch a little bit here and do a little squat there and, 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 and do some hamstring, all of a sudden, you know, I saw it in the gym. I went yesterday. All of a sudden, I'm, I'm noticing that my, my weights are increasing. Why do I say this, my friends? Because, my, my friends, listen, as you begin to put these things in place, you will be able to carry a bigger load. Yeah. So everybody understand the favor? Let's talk about likability. The truth of the matter is this. God's people, I'm going to be very honest with you. The people that struggle, the people that struggle with emotional intelligence, they, they struggle in relationships, they struggle in the idea of, of, their, of their emotions. What they tend to do is they over-spiritualize who they are. They, they try to compensate for the fact that they are lacking. Instead of developing this area of relational intelligence, emotional intelligence, what they will tell you is that they read the Bible, that they fast, that they pray, that they seek God. And they they begin to give you a laundry list of their their spiritual accolades. But the reality, and I'm not here to, to deny any of those things because we need those things, but the reality is, my friends, that sometimes some of the most spiritual people are the worst when it comes to relational intelligence. They, they say things like they've been in the prayer closet with God. And, and by the way, this is the premise of my book. I, I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, how is it that people leave the prayer closet and they come out like devils? They split churches, they gossip, they tell you in authority who you are, what you are, when you are, when to get on, when to get off. And they always tell you, God told me. If I hear that statement one more time, that God told you, God revealed, you know what, my friends, listen, if God told you, do it. If he's revealed something to you, live it. And sometimes you want to put people back in the prayer closet because it's like you're, you're undercooked. Get back in there and come out when you behave like Jesus. But we're in a process. We're all a different areas of growth. And so when it comes to this idea of likability, my friends, listen, don't use your spirituality to cover uh, weaknesses in other areas of your life. Yes. Okay. Number one, I want to give you seven things really quick. Number one, pretty simple. Be kind. It's not that complex. Be pleasant to people. Uh, We read last week that love is kind, that love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. In other words, uh, be thoughtful. Can I I say this? Smile more. Smile. Just smile at people. Just be 
Just be thoughtful to people. Just, you know, yesterday I come back to the, I come back to the gym and, you know, there's this big dude. He was, I found out he was, he was an African dude. I mean, uh, we were, it was leg day yesterday. Pastor Mo keeps touching. I said, stop touching my legs. It was leg day yesterday. I just said, bro, you know, he, he cleaned the machine. I said, sir, thank you. I really appreciate you doing that. And I mean, he almost had it. He, John, he almost, he was probably one of the brothers, you know, he had it almost like a full, full go. You know what I mean? I'm like, yeah, I'm going to be paralyzed if I do that. I just, you know, I said, sir, you're man. I said, man, you're a big guy. You're really strong. And, and I said, thank you for cleaning the machine. And then all, you know, we start talking all of a sudden, one of his other brothers begins to talk to me because I'm talking to him and he's like, oh, he goes, listen, those legs are fake. He got those at eBay. And, 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 and <laughs> we, we begin to have a, we begin to have a conversation. You know what I notice? when you are kind and pleasant to people, they're going to give you their knowledge. I say, hey, how many reps do you do? do And people just, when you are kind, people love to give you their knowledge. They love to give you their understanding. And and so he said, yeah, and he was. He was was like, he was like upper body and his friend was all legs. I said, why don't you guys like get together? (laughs) Luke 6.35. It says, but love your enemies and do good and land, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be the sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the thankful, to the unthankful, and to the evil. Do you understand? God is kind. God is pleasant even to people that don't like him and don't deserve it. Be kind to people. Let people through. I just wish people would be kind on the 410. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Just be pleasant. Be kind. Number two. Remember people's names. Remember people's names. People's name is their identity. When you, when you remember their name, listen, there's a lot of you. I try to remember every name that I possibly can. So I've said to Candace and others, I said, every, you know, once in a while, we should just put name tags on everybody so that, so that we would know people by their name. You know, thank God that in the church, we can go, hey, brother, hey, sister, you know, and, and fake it. But I don't want to fake it. I want to be able, I, I want to be able to know people's name and call them by their names. There's a lady who used to be with us. She's moved away. You know, she helped us in the in downstairs at, at one of these dinners. And, and I remember her name is Peter. I said, Hey Peter, thank you so much for helping us. She said, Pastor, you know my name? I said, Of course I know you. But her her face just lit up. Now, my friends, listen, I have some, there's like five, 600 of you. If I don't remember you, some of you have hard names. Why couldn't they have named you all Mary or Joe? Honestly. And then some of you have tough names, but to the best of my ability, I try to remember you and your families. Number three, look people in the eyes. Huh? Have you ever, anybody have a phone? Can I have your phone? Pastor Jay, you know, you ever, you ever, you ever, uh, you're talking to people and all of a sudden they're, they're, look, they're looking around you, you know, they're, they're, or, or all of a sudden their phone goes off and, or you're at the table with them, you're, you're at lunch and, 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 and you're conversing and all of a sudden they, they're answering their phone or they're on Instagram or, or they just got a stupid notification about something and you make people feel like they don't have any value, huh? And I'll be honest with you, I had to be coached in this because honestly, I, I, I'm connected all the time and my family would say to me, you're not here, even though it was ministry, Kimberly. I, and so I don't, you know what? I don't bring my phone. Listen, I don't bring my phone to the table anymore. Amen. It's table time. No TV, no iPad, no sports. Come on, Kimberly. This is where we have conversation. This is where we, this is where we commune. Everything else, listen, you're not the president of the United States that can wait. Huh? And if you're the president of the United States, you're probably taking a nap, to be honest with you, right? <laughs> Somebody ought to wake him up and tell him it's 1225. Luke 848, watch this. This is the woman with the issue of blood. Jesus says, daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Do you remember he's on an assignment? He's on his way to to heal Jairus' daughter who dies because Jesus takes time with this woman. But Jesus made everybody that was in front of him feel like you're the most important person. 
looking at you in the eyes, that, that you have value, you're important to me, I want to communicate with you. And when I'm finished communicating with you, I'm going to turn to the next person. Number four, display a genuine interest in others. The book of Philemon is an amazing book, but then Paul said to the Philippians, not only looking at your interest, but the interest of others. Amen. It, is, it is amazing to me how many people are just so self-absorbed, so selfish. I mean, I've had conversations with people, they'd never even ask me one question. How's the church? How are you? How are your family? But you just ask them one question, they're going to they're talk to you for an hour. Self-absorbed. I want, to, I want to come back to number five, but remember I told you, how do we repel people? By the way, you're like, oh, pastor, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. Really? The whole social media move is based on likability. Yes, Let's be honest. You post things because you want to be liked. You post things, you go, how many likes do I have? How many likes do I have? How many people like me? And then somebody writes a nasty thing, your whole world falls apart. Isn't that what we say to people, Pastor Mo, like us, like us, share us, subscribe to us. That's, that's, that's what it's based on. But my friends, listen, if your world is based on the opinion of others, you're going to be up and down like a roller coaster. I personally would be an insane person. They don't like you. They like you. They think you're a pile of garbage. They think you walk on water. Just, you know, I've, I've had, honestly, I've had a tough week. I'll be honest with you. One of the toughest weeks of my life. And yet, and yet this lady, precious lady, this Jamaican lady comes up to me in the, right after the first service. She just says, you know, pastor, your, your message, you're so real. You just bless me. You're, I'm like, Lord, is, do, you, do you send these people just to keep me from going insane? <laughs> Church, I want to help you. Do not believe the people that always criticize you and do not believe the people that always praise you. Huh? Somewhere in the truth, somewhere in the middle is the truth. All right. Listen, listen. Some, I'm almost done. Some of the things that repel people. Nasty disposition. Liars and exaggerators. People that are abrasive, combative, Difficult people, people that are hard to get along with. Can I say this way? Troublemakers. You're not going to have a lot of friends. People that are selfish, self-centered, self-absorbed. The proud and the arrogant. You, you, know what is, you know what is a phenomenal trait? If you are amazing and you're humble, people love that. But if you are amazing and arrogant, you are amazing and proud, you know, I, this is how I keep myself humble. I remind myself that no matter what I've accomplished, it's all because of the glory of God. Amen. It's all because of the favor of God. I say, Lord, you and I know the truth. What about the people that are dramatic, drama people? Come on, you just came through Easter. You have, you have family members. You know, everybody's eating, everybody's peaceful. And then cousin or uncle drama come in. <laughs> and they just... They just turn the whole day upside down. Because my friends, let me tell you, there are people that love drama. They love to cause trouble. They love, why? Because they need attention. What about this? Gossips. What about just pure annoying people? You know anybody like that? They just, they know how to get under your skin. They're like sandpaper. They just, they just know the wrong thing at the wrong time. Just to, just to, it's like the devil knows your buttons, right? You're like, oh, pastor, not I. Yeah, let me tell you about you. You see Brother Annoying coming down here. You go this way, right? <laughs> yeah. What about the person that has no filters? They just spout off everything they say without thinking, without understanding. They, they don't know the audience, the timing, or, or, or anything. You know, I just had this conversation with my, with my own daughter, and she said, you know, Dad, I appreciated what, what you said, but your timing was bad. I said, you know what? You're right. I wanted to protect her. There's some things I had to say to her, but my friend's timing is important. Uh, what, about, what about people like this? And I'm almost done. People that, people that have quote-unquote humor, right? I don't know if I have a... 
Yeah, let me try this one. People that have humor, you know, they'll, they'll write some, some things even on email, social media, whatever, and then, or a text message, then they'll go, LOL. Ha ha ha. No ha ha ha. Because there are people that have mastered humor, but in reality, they know how to get you. But you see, they think that little LOL can just remove all the sting. How many have found, you know, some people say, well, you know what? You know what? We need to be smart. We need to be intelligent people. How many of us have known intelligent people that are absolute jerks? Right? They're smart, but they're jerks. Jermaine's like, pastor, you're done. All right. Number five. Just give me five more minutes. Number five. Listen carefully. Listen to what people are saying to you. What they are communicating, because the reality is that listening is a skill that we don't develop very well. And the reality is that in confrontation, rather than listening, we're already creating our own comeback. I, I, I was just in meetings where, where it's like the, you're not even listening to the question, you're responding in another way. Isn't it interesting that you have two ears? Go ahead, Jermaine, and one mouth. Number six, be grateful. Be thankful. Philippians 1.3, Paul says this, every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. I can't tell you, I'm, I'm, not, trying to, I'm not trying to give myself a shout out, but I, I think about Kimberly or I think about Jennifer and, and I, is this true? I will just text, I say, I would, Kimberly, wherever you are right now, I just want to bless you. I want to thank you. Listen, I'm not trying to manipulate her. I'm not trying to gain brownie points with her. I'm not trying to gain anything out of it. It is a genuine heart that says, I am thankful for you. Come on, somebody, give God praise. To just genuinely have affection. I'm thankful. Because the truth is this in relationships, people have short memories. People forget the things you've done for them. You know, I've walked people through some dark, dark days and they, they just forget. They just forget. Here's my final one, and we're done. Everybody say, we're done. Yes. Number seven, I can't hear you, bro. Are you playing? By the way, everybody, this is Jermaine. Everybody bless Jermaine. He comes, um, is it Whitby? Is that where you live in, Whitby? Oshawa, that's even worse. Bless God. I mean, the school's in Whitby. Oshawa's even farther. I said to him, he needs to get a revelation to come west. And, um, but he's a precious brother. He's with us every once in a while. But number seven, my friends, listen, celebrate milestones. Celebrate birthdays. Celebrate anniversaries. Celebrate people's accomplishments. Celebrate when good things happen to people. Celebrate when God blesses people. Do you know what God looks for? Let me give you a secret. If you're praying for something, and then God answers that very prayer for somebody else. God looks for your attitude in that response. How do you respond when somebody gets a better car than you, a better house than you, a better wife than you? Huh? How do you respond when their kids are better behaved than your kids? <laughs> Kimberly, her kids were running around one Sunday. Oh, I'm going to tell her, Kimberly. She's like, well, I could just see that mother in her come out. You know, I said, hey, hey. I said, this is my house. Kimberly, this is my house. She's like, pastor there. I said, listen, I want the children to have fun in the house. No, you don't understand. I said, oh, I understand. When you get home, you do what you want. This is my house. I want these children to, to, to enjoy, to be celebrated, to know that, that, to know that they've come into God's house and that God, not that they're disrespectful, that, that I, want, I want them to know that God's house is a fun house. She's a great mom, by the way. How do you react? You know, I have, we have people here, they, they come, we have people here that have $300,000 cars. You want to know who they are, but I'm telling you. <laughs> One of our camera guys, he had, a, he had brought in a car. He brought in a Range Rover. He goes, come outside, Pastor. I'm going to show you this car. $180,000 Range Rover. I said, bro, I'll give you $45,000 right now. <laughs> that conversation didn't go over well. But anyway, sell I don't, 
I, I don't get all grumpy and moody because, oh, they have a better car, they have a better house, they have a better... No, no, no. Celebrate. So I'm going to close the service with this because we are a celebrating house. We are an honoring house. If I can have that, uh, we did this in the first service and I, I was able to, obviously I can't do it this time and surprise them, but um, we want to honor today uh, a son of the house who uh, as of, I think it's as of today, is celebrating, come on Pastor Moses, five years of full-time ministry. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Pastor Moses has, yeah, come on, bless him, bless him. Yeah. He's, um, he's been with me uh, 10 years, but full-time ministry, he does internship here. And I've just watched this young man grow in his, how many appreciate his teaching, okay? We, we tease each other because we, we, we just have a great, it's not a fake, we, we have a great relationship, we've traveled together, we eat together, we laugh together, we watch movies together, uh, he's at my house, it's not a, it's not a put on, really we have an amazing uh, relationship and I'm just so proud of him, he's, he's 28, did you say you were 28? Come on, how many know people at 28 can't even tie their shoes today, right? And we have this incredible young man that just loves God. And so uh, we, we are an honoring house. Pastor Moses, we love you. You're a gift to the body. You're a gift to me. You are a gift to me. And I love you. I bless you. And I just, I do love our relationship. And I know the church just absolutely, uh, yeah. He's, um, he's likable, he's teachable, he's humble. And so everything, I've, I've, I've poured my heart and soul into him. I will continue to pour my heart and soul because I want to see him uh, succeed uh, for the kingdom of God. And so, Pastor Moses, your best days are, are still ahead. And so I want you to know today, I really believe that at least once in everybody's life, they should get a standing ovation. And the church has twice now. Yeah. Um, he loves to scare people. And he can be annoying, you know, but, um, <laughs> but I know that I annoy him as well. And so I want to bless you today. Church, I want to tell you, listen to me very carefully. Grace. I received the word yesterday all the way from Australia. For you, grace is about to increase in your life. The prophet of the Lord, he said to me, Pastor, listen to me, church, and this is online. He said to me, because of the way you have handled, and there was a situation, and because of the grace that you have displayed, listen to what he said. He said, this grace is going to fall upon your people and upon the church. Are you ready to receive it? Lift up your hands. Father, in the name of Jesus, I declare that grace be multiplied, favor, blessing of the living God upon your people. And we thank you, Lord, that you would give us wisdom to grow, even in likability, that we will take this word seriously, that we will apply it, and even as we read earlier, that we will do an MRI in our own heart, even as David did it. Grace increase in the mighty name of Jesus. Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for watching. We really appreciate your time. Will you please like and subscribe so that you will get notifications? And by the way, your comments and your feedback are very important to us. Even sermon series and messages that you would like to hear about, please let us know. Drop us a line. We would love to incorporate that into our teaching and our preaching. We appreciate you and thank you.